Hey there, and welcome to the daily podcast where wisdom smacks us with kisses or love taps. I'm Michelle Spiva, a wisdom strengthening coach, your host, and practical priestess of wisdom. Join us daily to gain wisdom and mental strength as we tackle innovative thinking, address emotional and behavioral life traps, and yes, provide you with some practical how-tos to wrap it all up. So settle in or crank up the speed 2x, whatever gets your mental processes firing as we dive in. Stay tuned. Hey there, it's Michelle Spiva, your Practical Priestess of Wisdom with today's podcast of Wisdom Smack. Join me on the flip because we're going to be talking about something that most people think is a good thing. And that is being too smart, too intelligent. I bet you didn't realize that in some ways you might be a little too smart for the things that you're trying to do. And so in today's episode, I'm going to be giving you three things to consider, but you know how we do it here. I'm going to keep it really practical and give you two formats to help you to apply wisdom to make it where even though you might know a lot, you don't get trapped by knowing a lot to be able to go forward and get things done. So stick with me on the flip and I'll see you soon. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Wisdom Smack. Join me because today we're going to be talking about something that has been plaguing me and I'm thinking a lot of other people. And that is the complexity of our minds. And I'm going to be doing an episode on that. Don't worry. Uh, Well, not that you were worrying, but anyway, I want to pose this question to us today and just let us work through that a little bit. And the question is, are we too intelligent? And when I say too intelligent, are we too savvy with our thinking and ability to build complex ways of being and knowing to the point where we're not happy and we're not useful? And as I talk with you today, I want to like look at about, you know, maybe three things because that's what we can cover in our time together. And I have been looking at how Um, A lot of people are quick to associate and put uh, intelligence and expertise in one area and make it, you know, across the board. Like you can have a sommelier and they're being asked about the Olympics (laughs) or you can have someone who's extremely wealthy and they're being asked about uh, weather and and situations and so it's like we have gotten to the point where if there is intelligence and smarts uh people tend to believe that that's where all of the answers happen and so let's look at that so in my suppositions what i want to do is i want to look at the fallacies that we experience when we try to um equate things. And uh, for instance, why is it that in our society today, we equate the intelligence, if you will, of obtaining wealth with equaling wisdom? Another thing I want to look at is why as smart people, our society tends to foist on them the moniker of being the grand poobah of all right answers and how that's an assumption at best. And smart people are not necessarily the best people to ask the right questions because they might not have the best answers. And like I said, we'll look a little bit at that. And then if you're still with me, thank you. <laughs> I want to also look at situations where people become too smart for their own good, you know, and 
why intelligence can sometimes be a liability and block good decisions. Now, I want to give a shout out to one of my favorite thinkers, Morgan Housel, over at the Collaborative Fund, because he recently did an article that I'm going to link in the job, um, in the description to uh, take a look at for inspiring this. OK, so first and foremost, I want to give a definition of wisdom that I recently uh, gleaned from uh, actualize.org. Uh, shout out to him. And it is a great foundational understanding of wisdom in the practical sense. And we're all about practical wisdom here. So here we go. Um, in his definition, he describes wisdom as that keen discernment, good judgment, and proper priorities that people employ on a day to day basis. He also says that. To have wisdom, you understand how to correctly evaluate higher and lower values in life and that the wise person puts the higher values above the lower ones, doing them throughout their life to live wise lives. So looking at the king discernment, good judgment and proper priorities, it's I don't know to you, but it's it's becoming ever more clear that complexity and good judgment, proper priorities, and keen discernment do not necessarily mix. So here's the first thing I want to ask you. I want you to just think about it maybe later when you're pondering, meditating, or whatever. And I want to ask you, have you become addicted to the complex? Uh, do you get, ooh, you know, shivers through your body when there is something so eloquently complex and different and convoluted that it makes you feel like, yes, this is it. And if you answer honestly and the answer is yes, it's okay because that is needed in some times, but all the time, not so much. One of the areas that I have personally struggled with with my addiction to the complex is foregoing simple ways to dissect and use critical thinking when problem solving. You see, when we get into the complex and become addicted to it, we tend to muddy our ability to approach a task or a problem. In one of the other podcasts, and I think I might do that one next, uh, doing simple things with complex minds. Uh, that's the name of that uh, working um, podcast I'm thinking about doing. Uh, looking at why is it that a simple task can take us a long time to fire on and actually get done. And it comes back to being too intelligent, being too um, habitually trained to look for the unique, the tantalizing and the mentally stimulating portion of how we think and move and have our beings to do things when a boring, straightforward solution would help. So that brings me to talking about boredom uh, versus mental stimulation. And again, shout out to Morgan Housel. Um, he put it in a, a way that I, I thought was really cool. And so um, I'm going to read a, just a little bit of his article that I, if you, if you want to check it out, you can go to the show notes and um, look at it there. Um, but this is what he says. He says, uh, what's boring is often important. And the, sm the smartest people are the least interested in what's boring. He goes on to give some uh, examples and because uh, his uh, company and blog are, are financially facing, the examples he used are such that he says, for instance, hedge funds blow up and Wall Street executives go bankrupt uh, doing things that are less in, that a less intelligent person would never consider. Remember, common sense. So basically wisdom is very practical common sense, being able to decipher and discern the proper priorities and having the keen discernment and good judgment to pick those. And so sometimes wisdom will have you following the boring path. And he goes on to say that there's a sweet spot where you grasp the important stuff, but you're not smart enough to be bored with it. You guys, this is so powerful. I'm going to read that again, beloved. Just listen to it. Let it marinate like butter on your soul. He says, there is a sweet spot where you grasp the important stuff, but you're not so smart enough to be bored with it. 
And that also leads me to the second point of 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 making the assumption that smart people always have this right answer you know so we first talked about to recap we first talked about the fallacy or the the misnomer that or or the misunderstanding that just because someone may have achieved something and be very smart in a subject does not necessarily mean that they're wise and with that we've started to look at the fact that boring a lot of times is the answer. It's not the triple Lindy somersault of thought that no one has ever come up with. It's not being so clever and shrewd that you cause yourself to do more than you need to. And on the tip of my tongue um, is a, um, a name for when someone makes a complicated uh, apparatus to do a simple task. I can't remember it off the top of my head right now. Hopefully it'll come back to me before we get through having our little talk today. But this is kind of what it looks like. And so the second point, as I said, is making the assumption that smart people always have the right answer. They do not. They don't. And sometimes we are too intelligent in how we approach uh, simple things with our complex thinking. You know, so let's, let's, you know, look at what it looks like to be addicted to the complex. Going back to uh, Morgan Housel's article, he took a statement from a computer science by the name of Edsker uh, Dijostra, Dijikstra, forgive me if I've mur murdered that, well, they know if I did, but you get it. And um, this is what the gentleman once wrote. He said, complexity has a morbid attraction. When you give an academic audience a lecture that is crystal clear from alpha to omega, your audience feels cheated and leaves the lecture hall commenting to each other. That was rather trivial, wasn't it? The sore truth is that complexity sells better. And I've really kind of been looking at uh, what the masses uh, what the diet of the of, of mass consumerism looks like. And it is true, complexity sells better because complexity involves uniqueness, specificity, and currentness. It, it is uh, your unique selling proposition and it gives you uh, all the woo-haws and the, uh, the, the things that are like, oh, this is nice. And it tickles that part of the brain that loves to be stimulated with something new, the curiosity center. But we have to be careful because smart people are really good at this. They are really good at um, crafting complex, intriguing, and curiosity-bound uh, stories and narratives to articulate their world and the way they look at it. And so a lot of times you can find that very smart or intelligent people convolute an issue and make things more complicated than necessary or need be. And so that's a lot of times why we shouldn't make these assumptions that the intelligent people need to answer uh, all the questions because a simple mind, and when I say a simple mind, I'm not talking about a impaired mind, but a simple mind that has that clarity of thought to go back and be wise with keen judgment or discernment, good judgment, and an ability to discern the higher value priorities, they are not going to necessarily come up with the same type of answer or, or su suggestion that someone who is pontificating on the complexities of life. You know, think about when there have been times when maybe you've had a conversation or you've just been pondering something and that addiction to the complex starts to come in. That's where we get a lot of, a lot of the what ifs, the what about isms, the um, uh, this is good for this situation, unless it isn't, you know, all of the kitchen sink of everything that could possibly go wrong or go on. And it makes for uh, procrastination or stagnation where you just really can't even do, even do anything. And so that's why I want to present to you today that sometimes that clever, shrewd, uh, slick, 
smart, intelligent thinking that you think is so great, it might be that we've been sold a bill of goods to be programmed and controlled to think that complex is better. When a plain spoken, straight to the point suggestion or answer is the best way to go. So going back to what Morgan wrote, and I thought this part was really brilliant. I wanted to make sure I uh, said it to you today. And he said in his article, when complexity is the preferred language of very smart people, great ideas can become walled off from ordinary people. Most of the allure of the information age is that ideas can be shared among huge groups of people. But among the super intelligent, that's often not the case. They're speaking a different language. And so that brings me to the the third point I want to kind of take a look at. And that is, there are situations when people become too smart for their own good, where intelligence is a liability and blocks good decisions. And you know, as practical as wisdom is, wisdom is for all, smart, dumb, indifferent. But it takes some mental clarity, focus, and exercise to stay closer to the middle where wisdom lives in the crossroads and the ability to take any direction um, to get you to a point or to get you to a a better life. And so I'm going to say this again because I'm loving this definition from uh, actuality, uh, actuality.org where he says, Wisdom is keen discernment, good judgment, and proper priorities. It, wisdom, I'll say it again, wisdom is keen discernment, good judgment, and proper priorities. And so when we take that and we look at my third supposition that uh, there are situations where people can become too smart for their own good and that intelligence is a liability that blocks good decisions. I want to give you some simple applications because it's all, you know, I don't ever want to waste your time. I, I want to give you maybe a little theory and some applications. So these are some applications, if you will, or little frameworks to help you to start evaluating. If you're getting, if you're overthinking this, if you're being a little too smart for your own good, where it will stymie you and 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 have you stuck in a rut, uh, spinning your mental wheels and not moving forward. And I'm talking to myself here. That's why I grab these because this is what I'm using to keep going forward and not overthink things, not be, try to uh, feed my addiction for the complex, especially when I'm writing my books. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, the first one that I want to give you, the first framework is is four words that begin with an S and I just call them the four S's and I can't quite remember where I, well, you know what? I there was a book that was put out by a um, gentleman who is a repairer of uh, fine uh, instruments, and I should have figured out um, the book before I started. But if I can, I'll put them in the show notes. And if not, um, just understand this: he had a format where he uses these four S's, and the format is this: simple short, small, and slow. And my interpretation of that is when I'm considering something or having to make a decision or plan uh, um, a point of implementation and execution to get stuff done, (laughs) or even when I'm considering uh, uh, a controversial uh, point of, um, of, of something going on in the in today's world. These four S's work really well. All right, so let me take them, you know, one at a time real quick. So again, they are simple, short, small, and slow. Simple. What is the simplest point or question or problem that is presented here? Strip out all of the fluff, strip out all of the things that are what I like to call the nice to haves to consider and get to the point. What is the simplest denominator of uh, what, what you're dealing with? And when you 
when you're thinking about the simplest, the way I have been uh, learning to approach this is to first and foremost, check and see if there's any subtext. You know, is there any double meaning? Is there any deeper meaning? Am I dealing with a symptom instead of a uh, uh, the actual issue? So in order to drill down to that simple, start getting into that habit of checking to see if there's any subtext or if I'm dealing with a symptom and get down to the root of something. So that's the first S. The next one is short. And when I'm looking at short, what is the shortest answer, path, or meaning to what I'm dealing with or how I'm going to deal with it? There is this um, this process that is used in um, online industries for putting together courses. And I'm actually still working on a course that I'm going to be putting out very soon. Stick around, you guys. I'll let you know about it. Um, but it talks about if you want to help someone to solve a problem, remember the man over board rule. Now, I've never really liked that example because it never resonated with me until... I started realizing that the reason why I wasn't moving as fast is because I was addicted to complexity. And so with the man over rule, what it simply says, and I say it's simple, is to keep it short, keep the message short. Imagine a person is drowning off the side of a boat and you need to help save them. What is it that you do or say to help get them out of danger and back in the boat? And by keeping it short, like you throw the life uh, raft or, or, or the, the vest and you say, grab this. Or you say, over here. You see, it's very short and to the point. So with those four S's we've got first, we've got the simple. Uh, keep getting it down to the lowest denominator of what you're really dealing with, checking to see if there's any subtext, checking to see if uh, you're dealing with a symptom instead of a root problem, and then keeping it short. What do you do to save someone who's drowning? What is the short command or word or action that you would do to get to the point of whatever it is you're dealing with, whether it be an answer, a plan, or whatever? And then the next thing is, and this is the one that really kind of had me pause because I was not good at this one. And the next one is small. Keep it small. And to keep something small is to avoid the uh, mental sprawl of the what ifs, nice to haves, what about isms, and uh, oh, and this, you know, all of that. Keeping it small is going to not force you, but give you guidance, strong guidance and boundary to stick to the task at hand, to stick to the most direct way of going about answering something, thinking about something, pursuing something, setting up a plan. And I wish I could tell you the small part is easy, well, at least for me, it has not been easy. It has been frustrating. I, I'm not going to lie. There have been some tears shed and it, it's something. And I believe that it is part of the muscle that must be grown to stay attached to wisdom and not go off into the poppy seed fields of intelligence where there is all this mental masturbation and stimulation happening. And then the last one is slow. And with the slow, the slow is how are you able to, not how are you, it, the slow is how you're able to make a foundationally, fundamentally sound argument, answer, approach, or whatever. Because when we go fast, we do issues and problems. Um, case in point, uh, I had... Um, my yard work done and um, someone, the, the person that was doing it was using a riding lawnmower. And he didn't realize until after he had gotten through because he was going so fast and there was something wrong with the blades on his uh, riding lawnmower that by the time he finished, I had pieces that were not cut. I had 
pieces of my land that had deep gouges in it when the blade was moving too fast that it couldn't negotiate it. So it used force to tear up the ground. And I thought about that. Yeah, I was a little peeved, you know, but I was like, it'll grow back. But I thought about how sometimes when things are boring, yeah, we tend to go too fast. And this is what we end up with. So taking our time to go slowly to evaluate and really look at have we simplified things? Have we given the best short answer? Uh, have we done things that are, are small and to the point and contained and done them in a slow way? That is really going to be very impactful and very helpful. One of the things that um, I, I like is how when you do something and uh, I've had this compliment given to me a few times and I really enjoy when I get that compliment, but it's something like this. When you're able to take what someone has already known, but uh, never was able to put into a succinct phrase or wording that encapsulates the entire feeling, they feel awe-inspired because now they're able to articulate it outside their head. And when you're able to give them that, you have done the four S's, simplified it, shortened it down to, to uh, the most direct point, kept it small where it wasn't convoluted, bloated, and full of puffery. And you could tell that it was marinated to get that good, good, deep, deep impact of potency. All right. So in a little time that we have left, I'm going to just cover um, another one that's real quick. And I call it the DOC or the DOC, DOC, and it's for do, observe, correct. So now that you've got your four S's, you're not going to hit them out of the ballpark every time. When you first start off, it's going to take some practice. And so this is how you start to practice doing the four S's. You're going to actually do them. And then you're going to observe what you've done and be honest with yourself. Uh, did you go off into the ether with it being over the top, convoluted, complicated? Did your uh, mental ability weave a story that's too complex that you can't deliver it properly? You know, those are the kind of questions that I want you to take a look at when you're evaluating how well you are being earthly good <laughs> with your think with your thinking and your approach to life. Uh, the next one, um, so we've got doing it and then we've got observing it. And then here's the next one and that is correcting it. Then going back and correcting. Now I will say this, when you're using DOC, you don't have to do it by yourself. You can definitely bring in someone who can help you by you doing, they observe, and then you guys work together to correct. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of times when people get very good coaches and coaching, this is what they're doing. They're doing the four S's to simplify stuff down, make it short, small, and take it slow. And then they're doing the DOC, the doing the action, observing it, and then going back and correcting it. And just by doing things like that, you'll be amazed at what you're able to get done. Now, I do want to say another quick thing before. Um, I, I let you go because I, I have a little extra time, so I'll give you this bonus. And that is to explore the deeps, D-E-E-P-S, the deeps. Explore deep learning, deep training, deep knowing, and deep wisdom. Now, learning and training are different. And learning and training are different in that. Training is when you learn, when you are taught, I should say, or shown or repetitively practiced in doing a certain task or skill. So when you're trained to do something like bake a cake, you're trained to use a recipe and to produce that item. But when you learn to bake a cake, you are taught and educated on the types of um, bases for the cake, uh, the activators uh, for the chemical process, the sweeteners, what a, what is a cake and what's a cookie or for my UK folk, what is a biscuit, you know, those different things. And so deep learning and deep 
training uses those four S's to really get down past the surface area to start understanding, am I dealing with subtext? Am I dealing with metaphoric meaning? Am I dealing with the real issue at hand? Am I building the keen discernment, good judgment, and proper priorities of wisdom? And so I've said this before on other podcasts, but I will say this again. And this is something that uh, I've had a good few, good number of people come back and say, this changed, you know, the way I look at things. And that is that everything you encounter is going to be uh, at least a, f- um, a bit of information or data, and it will be considered as currency, you know, the monies. And so whenever you observe something, whenever you interact with something, treat it as the the currency, the value that it is. And then you have knowledge. Now, knowledge is taking that information or the data and processing it through your mind to develop some attitudes and feelings about it and getting a certain amount of learning and training from what you've taken in. And that becomes your riches. That helps you to become proficient, to be able to move and um, interact in your world for greater success. But then there is wisdom. And what wisdom is, again, wisdom is being able to extrapolate out all of the knowledge and information to make it palatable so that you can be very keen in your discernment, very good at, dis- at judgment, and always being able to pick the proper priorities. And guess what? Wisdom is wealth, the right kind of wealth. All right. So guess what, you guys? Yeah, my time is up. And I want to thank you for yours. If you have made it to this point, oh, blessings on you, beloved. Thank you so much for joining me. So this has been Michelle Spiva, your Practical Priestess of Wisdom, with today's podcast of Wisdom Smack. So again, I want to ask you, are you too intelligent to be if any good or, or even happy? Ponder on that. And I bet you're going to be surprised at what you come out with. So don't forget to like, subscribe, comment. Let me know. Reach out and check the show notes. And guess what? I'm going to see you real, real, real soon. Bye. And that's going to do it for today's podcast of Wisdom Smack with Michelle Spiva. If you like this podcast, please help us get the word out. Like, comment, subscribe, and even share. And if you really like it, please help us continue to get the word out by considering using this show's link for Amazon. So when you want to go to Amazon and you do all of your general shopping, Uh, please use michellespiva.com forward slash AMZ. It's simple as that. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And this show might receive a little bit of commission that will go towards helping to further get these episodes out to you and to others. So thank you so much for listening. This has been Michelle Spiva with Wisdom Smack. Bye.